Hello and welcome to Talking Politics. Today we will be looking at topical issues on politics throughout the week, starting with the Labour Leadership Contest. I have two guests on set with me today. I have Meg Davidson. She is a local councillor for South End Borough Council, representing Pretty Well, Pretty well Ward. Meg, you're very welcome Thank to our you. studios. And I also have Brian Potman, who is our political correspondent. Brian, you're very welcome. It's good to be here. Thank you very much, Wilma. Yeah. Let's take a look at what's happening in the Labour Party. Now, starting with former Prime Minister Gordon Brown. On Sunday, he warned of the consequences of the Labour Party becoming a party of protest as the battle to become Labour's next leader intensifies. We are grieving. It really hurts. I know myself as someone who should know because of what happened in 2010 what it is like to feel rejection and to feel defeat. We are grieving and it hurts. And I'm not here to attack any individual candidate. And I'm not here to say abandon your high ideals. What I'm here to say is that the best way of realizing our high ideals is to show that we have an alternative in government that is credible, is radical, and is electable, is neither a pale imitation of what the Tories offer, nor is it the route to being a party of permanent protest rather than a party of government. And I want to set out what I think needs to be done. We are grieving. It's worse than that. There is demoralization and there is despair and that's reflected in what is happening in the talks amongst Labour members. And there's only one word to describe it. Our hearts are broken. But you know, there is one thing worse than having broken hearts. It is powerlessness. Our hearts can be broken and yet it is worse to find out we are powerless to do anything about it. To see a wrong and not to be able to right it. To see an injury and an injustice and not be able to correct it. To see suffering and be able to do nothing about it. To see pain and know you cannot heal it. To see good that needs to be done and change that needs to be made and not to be in a position to do it. And when I know and I argue and I think you believe that the only way that we can avert the pain and end the suffering is by securing in future the election of a Labour government to deliver on our priorities. And when I see the opinion polls that say that the one grouping in the party that is likely to get most votes is the one grouping that even its own supporters say is least likely to be able to form a government, then we have to look at the lessons of our history. Former Prime Minister Gordon Brown there at Meg. Let's take a critical look at his statement. He says, the best way of realising our higher ideals is to show that you have an alternative in government that is credible to radical and three electable. It's neither a repel imitation of what the Tories offer, neither is it the route to being a party of permanent protest rather than a party of a government. This clearly depicts the current status of the Labour Party. What comes to your mind when you think of this? I know you're from the yes, Conservative Party. Yes, I am from the Conservative Party, but the, you know, really what he says is, is quite true, but the great dilemma for the, the Labour Party at the moment is um, that it looks as if the majority are going to vote with their hearts rather than their heads mm. in the leadership um, contest. And um, it's, if they, well, my personal opinion, and it's obviously shared by some people in the Labour Party, that if they go down that road of going radical, um, they won't be electable. And it's a real problem for them. It is a problem for them. What do you think, Brian? It's a problem for the country, Wilma. Um, that in England, in the UK, we have two-party politics, or has been. We have Conservatives, we have the Labour Party. One one's in power, one is in opposition, and then then argue against the other per party's point of view and so on and so forth. If we don't have that opposition, the Conservatives can go on with their austerity. They can ramp up the austerity. Um, whether or not the country believes that's the best thing to do, they voted them into power, so one must assume they do. Labour will just become more and more marginalised. 
And looking at this now, with the chaos going in the Labour Party, Gordon Brown has said, look, I'm not supporting any candidate. The point here is we have to have one voice. Not everyone seems to have one voice in the Labour Party now. There seem to be different opinions coming out. And so there's so much chaos that even the voters do not know who exactly to go for. Even initially, the favourite was Andy Burnham, is now Jeremy Coburn. So, by well, unity is absolutely vital for any political party. Now, maybe when they've got through this election, they've selected their leader. If they all fall in behind their new leader and really make an effort to be united, um, then they could make progress. But the danger is they're going to be so fragmented and they could descend into a sort of civil war seen it, it's happened in other parties so nobody can look too smug about this. No, no, certainly. So th there's been a lot of complaints about new Labour and old Labour. You're talking about civil war. That seems to be where the battle line is drawn because Andy Burnham, Yvette Cooper, they're kind of in the middle but leaning slightly to the left. Then there was Liz Kendall that came in and she got trounced by the unions in the first few weeks of her campaign. So the battle lines are drawn. It'll be interesting to see where we end up. It is. It will be very interesting indeed. Well, as ballot papers arrive for more than 600,000 members and supporters of the Labour Party, the wider electorate thinks Mr. Corbyn, who is the favourite to win, stands the least chance of returning Labour to power. In 2020, the Comrades poll shows. Today, Andy Burnham vowed that if he becomes Labour leader, he will involve Jeremy Corbyn in rebuilding the party. People haven't drifted away from Labour. Labour has drifted away from them. So the choice now is not between change or no change, but what kind of change do we want? Jeremy has brought real energy to this race. I want to capture that and would involve Jeremy in my team from the outset. I want the people who are drawn to his campaign, particularly young people, to help us rebuild our party from the bottom up, to re-energise it, make it the people's party once again. Quite an interesting statement from Andy Burnham, Meg. Andy Burnham is more to the right. Jeremy Coburn is a leftist. Can they work together? I think they would have to. Um, I think it would be more of a challenge if Jeremy Corbyn is it elected as leader of the party because he's got um, some really good qualities mm. uh, and he is well respected and it's obviously attracting huge crowds to hear him speak but it's different to be he's always been a bit on the the outside a bit of the element of the maverick it's quite different when you are the person in charge and would he be able to to lead well looking at the ideas and yeah. the ideals of um, Jeremy Corbyn Yes. Is that what the larger populace of Britain wants? Do you think he can actually lead the party to win in 2020? Well, if he, he has very strong principles, no doubt about that. But he, but you can be sincere, but be sincerely wrong. And uh, we've just had a general election, and the the results showed um, that they didn't. Um, the, the British uh, public did not favour the radical left policies. When, who knows, I mean, we couldn't have foreseen the situation that we're in now, just three months ago, so yeah. five years is an awfully long time. But I think it, it'd be hard to imagine that he could attract such a wide, this is Jeremy Corbyn, could attract that level of support that he would need to win, you know, we've got to gain so many extra parliamentary seats to secure majority mm -hmm. in the House of Commons. So it's hard to imagine, I have to say. Do you think Jeremy Corbyn will buy into what Andy Barnum has said, uh, working together with him if he wins? I'm uh, siding with, with Meg here. As I said, I, um, Jeremy Corbyn is a man of massive principle. He has his views on what should be and he's seems to be fairly inflexible, completely authentic, but fairly inflexible. Will he buy into Andy Burnham's as a party? He will want to support the Labour Party. I'm sure he cares deeply for it. But his views are a long way to the left of Andy Burnham, because he originally started off being the union's favourite. Mm. Now all of them have moved over to Jeremy Corbyn. 
So how Andy Burnham feels about that and how he changes his mantra and what his policies he's putting out there, we'll have to see and we'll have to see if Jeremy Corbyn can agree with him. But it's obvious, as Meg said, I mean, the larger populace here in Britain didn't vote Ed Miliband because of the leftist ideas and ideals that he had and the principles. And these are the same policies and principles that Jeremy Corbyn has adopted. And he's the one that is the most favoured to win, yet he's the one that would not seem to garner a majority for the 2020 elections. I completely, well, my, it's... Um the problem with the, or the problem with these elections, these elections, it's Labour Party voting out who they think would best for the Labour Party. As a reflection of the whole country, it has to be seen in that way. They are not representative of the voters that voted the last election. They're representative of the people that vote in the Labour Party leadership elections. Um, so we have to hope that they choose a leader that can be good in opposition, that, that can build the Labour Party up again, that can really find out where the grassroots are going and what they want. Because at the moment, Labour's in a bit of no man's land. Um, they mm -hmm. thought their grassroots would see them into power, they didn't. So who are they campaigning for? Who do, whose votes do they want? Andy Burnham will have to come up with some answers. If not him, Jeremy Corbyn will. Let's see if they can work together. Let's see who wins. Yeah. Well, David Cameron has marked the 100-year anniversary of the first majority Conservative government since 1997 with a promise that all schools would be given the opportunity to convert to academy status. A hundred days ago, I stood on the steps of Downing Street and told the British people that the first Conservative majority government would govern on behalf of everyone. Already, we're delivering on the plan we set out in our manifesto a plan to provide security at every stage of your life. It starts by giving every child a great education. We want everyone to have a chance to succeed. We're transforming all failing schools into academies and for the first time taking the power to convert coasting schools into academies as well. It's about making sure that every child has the chance to fulfil their potential. That means every child has an excellent school to attend with great teachers. We're also delivering on our promise to increase NHS funding and make sure it's always there when you and your family need it. A truly seven-day NHS. Well, we're actually putting an extra £10 billion into the NHS um, following the NHS's own plan and that includes plans for a seven-day NHS. To help those who are working hard, putting in the hours to support themselves and their family, we're introducing a national living wage, an important step in moving Britain to a higher wage, lower tax and lower welfare society. Two and a half million people will get a direct pay rise. Those currently on the minimum wage will see their pay rise by over a third to this parliament, a cash increase for a full-time worker of over £5,000. We're increasing the amount you can earn before you start paying tax and reducing the benefit cap so it always pays to work. To support parents back into work, the Queen's speech honoured our promise to double free childcare to 30 hours a week for working parents of three and four year olds. And to give more families the security of their own home, we're extending the right to buy to tenants of housing associations. 86% of people want to own their own home. And so it's really important, as well as building uh, more homes, that we should look for the opportunities to allow people to fulfill that aspiration. For the security you deserve when you retire, we've increased the state pension through the triple lock and we're taking all but the most expensive homes out of inheritance tax so you can pass your family home onto your loved ones. No more inheritance tax on family homes, aspiration supported, the tax paid only by the rich, the security of home ownership restored, promise made, promise delivered. Yeah. We promise to maintain our world-class armed forces to guarantee our national security, and that's what we're doing. Well, the defence budget's going to go up for the first time in some years. We're going to spend more on defence, which is really good news for the armed forces. And we've set out a balanced plan to clear the deficit and start running a surplus so that Britain starts living within its means again. A hundred days in, we're showing that it's a Conservative majority government which has the ideas to build the one-nation vision. And in doing so, 
to deliver real social mobility in our country. We will not waste a second in getting on with the job, supporting working people, and delivering the prosperity and security on which our future depends. Prime Minister David Cameron's speech is celebrating 100 days in office. Now, Meg, you are from the Conservative Party. That's right. Yeah. Obviously, the Prime Minister has done a lot in 100 days, mm -hmm. and moving thousands of schools away from council control is at the heart of his One Nation policy. Why the academies? Well, this is, we'll be building on what's been happening over a number of years. They see it overall, it's been successful and it enables, it brings more variety and diversity and choice for parents. It, um, it means that the, the funding goes direct to the school and it's been felt in years past that where it was all local authority, they, take, they have to take a chunk of money from that education budget for all the administration and in some places it was felt too much was going to the central bureaucracy, not enough to the front line in the schools. And academy schools have a lot more flexibility, they can innovate and um, you know, they've, if they are not providing good quality education and providing what parents and children need, then they, you know, they won't get the pupils. So they, um, so they feel this is um, something to, to continue that progress because we've had a lot of schools where uh, children were being shortchanged, that they were getting a very poor quality of education. And it, so it's not so much what type of school, the really important thing is giving our children a good education and the best start in life. So changing, if all schools became academies, it's very likely that achievement is going to rise, the standard and quality of education is going to improve. Yeah, it was um, the thing that Tony Blair said uh, 10, 15 years ago now, said bog standard comprehensive. And that was, I think, what the academy scheme was meant to, to pick up and blow out. Because, as, as you say, Meg, um, academies have more independence. They don't lose a cut of their money to go to um, local government. Um, and they can appoint their own teachers. They're free of union control and so on and so forth. Um, but the real conservative principle thing that comes through academy schools, and you touched on this, it says where you send your child, that is where the government funding will go. Rather Absolutely. than just being paid to the school, it follows the pupil. So if the schools want to keep their money, they need to keep their pupil and their parents satisfied, or otherwise that kid can leave. And so the catchment areas is another thing. Um, you need more schools in its catchment area, or each child is stuck with no choice. No parent is, has a choice of where their child goes. So um, more schools, do need because we need the choice more academy schools that is what our current government is going to do let's look at the nhs now the british medical association said ministers have actually failed to say how they will plug a 22 billion pounds black hole in the nhs finances but they've also done something they said you have promised uh, seven day services without setting out how this will happen right well they to achieve seven day services, that has got to be done by getting the, the, the doctors on board, and that's what the government's been trying to do. I mean, the BMA is as much a trade union for doctors as, it, you know, as the professional body for the med medical profession. Um, and it, this has got to be worked out because the, there is clear evidence that just having the Monday to Friday services. Uh, it means that you know you have a better chance of survival in hospital if you're admitted in the middle of the week. I mean, if you go in at a weekend, even allowing for the fact if you're admitted at the weekend, it's more likely an emergency. But th it's true. There's there's lots of people who languish in the hospital bed, waiting from Friday to Monday for either tests to be done to be seen by the consultant. And this is something to to change it because illness it's a seven day a week you know health care is seven days a week um, but they've obviously they've got to negotiate it I mean, doctors have a, a good point in that there are places some uh, like emergency care obviously that's already seven days 
And it's not just a case of, oh, you have to put a doctor on duty at the weekend, you've got to have the support services. Some hospitals are doing this. So, and also that means if you can give people the tests and the treatment um, and they can be seen by the consultant right through the week, then they're not staying in hospital unnecessarily. Let's go to Southend and you are the councillor for Pretty Well Ward, which is actually the oldest part of South End. Yeah. And when announcing a redevelopment on the council webpage, the councillor there, Ron Woodley, the leader of South End Council, um, he said that a new affordable housing was much needed. South End High School for Boys is to extend its facilities to cope with the demand for places and London South End Airport has just been announced the top airport in Britain after a £21 million investment. Well, congratulations for that. But where do we see Southend in the next five years? Where should Southend be? Right, well, some years ago, what, 10 or so years ago, that the, the council um, realised that so Southend, says it's been a, historically, it's been a seaside resort. Well, it's not going to flourish just as a seaside mm. resort. It's got to be a town it attracts business and innovation it, that happens to be by the sea so when we still want our visitors uh, but we've really got to build up the town in other respects and, that, and a lot of work's been done a lot of regeneration and I see that that will continue some things got held up really because of the recession and for people who drive into South End um, they t I hope that in five years time it'll be the, the traffic will be flowing better on the main road into South End because of road improvements that are um, scheduled uh, with the help of government, central government funding. And I hope that uh, the main road into the town centre, which is called Victoria Avenue, part of which runs through my ward in Prittlewell, um, it's been blighted for years with these derelict office blocks. and. Uh, Nobody could afford to do anything about it, but now they've, they've been sold and they're scheduled for redevelopment. So that will look a lot better. And we hope there will be uh, more housing because that is a, a challenge. And we hope to see um, if we can improve the transport links with London. Um, we hope to see the, the town really flourishing. With Miss Brown, we're looking at lots of people from London moving over to South End, especially the younger ones who want to get onto the property ladder and find the houses in London really expensive. The, 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 the property thing is, is key, I think, Wilma. In South End, the property will be less than they are on the East End of London. Um, and and the, the cost of the travel on the trains, the commute, again, that would be less than the, the difference between the buying a house in London and buying a house if in South If that is subsidised, so you think a lot of people will prefer that? I, I, I think, think a lot of people do already, yes. I think it's a reasonable do, yes. choice. Certainly there's a lot of people that live in Chelmsford and commute in and up near an Ipswich and so on and so forth, which is a bit, bit on the main, my main, main rail lines. But it, it, it will give people a choice. You can say you can either live there, nice, slightly more tranquil surroundings and commute in, or you can have the hustle bustle of London. You've got a family, you may be single, you may have a car, you may not drive, which is more convenient for you. And I think South End will give people a choice. Now, you share in your blog how South End Council will face a massive challenge over the next years as budgets are reduced further. Now, where do you think your council can find the extra savings while protecting funding for vulnerable people? Right, so obviously councils, it seems, I um, don't think we can remember the time when councils used to get a, you know, an increase in their central, <laughs> uh, their block funding from central government. Those days seem very far away. But how every council has had to make savings year on year, so it is getting harder. We've done the easy stuff. But what I see, it, and also we've got growing demand, uh, the elderly population, yeah. and so the biggest item of expenditure is adult social care. Uh, that would be true for you know, other councils as well. Mm. So what we've got to do is um, obviously try and eliminate where there's duplication, you know, those sort of common sense savings, but working, a lot more joint working, and, and it's a very good um, development that we've 
to start it earlier this year, with uh, the adult social care budget is being pooled with funding from the South End Clinical Commissioning Group. So health and social care. We tried for years to share budgets, but this is much more for real. They're going to okay. commission services jointly, and that is a way to be much more effective and save money. I just recently elected to the council, so I see some things with fresh eyes. I think there's things like getting it right first time, so, which we don't always do, it's probably it, true of any organisation. Um, if you do it right first time, they provide a good service, answer the, the resident's question, you save a lot of time and you'll save a, a lot of money. So, so a few ideas there. <laughs> So your main point is actually saving a lot of time. When you do save a lot of time, of course, you save a lot of money. Yeah, and, and also there's going to be a lot more joint working between councils mm -hmm. at a sort of infrastructure projects. Mm -hmm. It's not clear yet which sort of councils Southend would team up with. Could be Essex County Council and others, but we could look more to the Thames Gateway and Kent councils. So, but there's some very serious consideration being given to that. So you can do more things jointly with the emphasis on localism and devolution. They'll have more, I think, more scope to sort of decide how, rather than central government say how you can spend this when you have more um, local choices. Which means the councils will have a lot more flexibility when it comes to teaming up and sharing infrastructure, and that would actually save a lot of money. I, I, I think so, Wilma. It's the same across the public sector where police are being encouraged to share back offices between forces. The frontline officers, that's for each team to decide. But in terms of the back office stuff, like doing the payroll and so on and so forth, well, combine the authorities. They all use the same payroll program. We just haven't got all the same people on there. And certainly in councils all over the country, there is uh, opportunities to um, make efficient the services you offer in the back office as well. Um, as you were saying, you, fresh eyes, you've seen opportunities. Fresh eyes, I think, is key in mm. any um, regeneration of council services because people get used to doing the same they job. Do, yeah. People come in. Um, but it's, I, I do think the regions have an opportunity now because more power has been given to the regions. Uh, mayors are encouraged in towns so they can look after it. So the administration is done locally, as, as you were saying. Um, and we have to trust that the councils elected on the councils can, that they're more independent. And the new mindset, the new generation, I think will be, have more independent mindsets as opposed to the Jeremy Corbyn. Um, similarities we could pick out of yeah. the 1970s, 80s, 90s. Well, the councils could team up quite all right. They would save a lot of money, but a lot of people will lose their jobs, obviously, because you're trying to carry out duplication. There, there certainly have been. It's, um, yeah. Over the past five years, local authorities have shed, or the public sector mm -hmm. as a whole, there are fewer, fewer jobs. But, um, but then, other things have been developed, people, there's a lot more people going, setting up their own business. Um, we're looking, it's another area where the councils have to really decide on what are their um, statutory duties, their core services. Perhaps in the past they've tried to do too many things and it's not feasible, but I think we could do a lot more to engage with local people with the voluntary sector There's, there is a lot happening mm. already but to engage them rather than we got into a bit of the mindset i think that the council somebody else will tidy this up or do um do everything and they can't but that's where you can get local people there's people that you know they set up trusts or friends of some organization to supplement the work that the statutory authorities do. So there's quite a few ideas worth looking at there. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mike, for coming on the programme. We have to round up now. I look forward to having you again on this programme. Thank you very much. And thank you so much, Brian, for coming on. Thank you very much. Viewers, this is Talking Politics. We have been discussing uh, the Labour Party. What is going on in the party? Who is going to be the next leader? 
the members and supporters of the party have begun to receive their ballot papers to vote. And what are the ex-prime ministers like Gordon Brown saying about the Liberal Party? And 100 days in office for David Cameron. If you have any questions, you can send emails to talkingpolitics at lovealtv.co.uk. In the meantime, enjoy the rest of our programs.